Okay, yeah, so today I'm going to talk through a project run in our lab looking at long-term muscle protein synthesis and uh, resistance exercise training adaptations in a group of younger and older individuals. So, oh, oh, there we go. Um, so just to start off, uh, I just wanted to say why is it important that we uh, measure in muscle metabolism or why are we interested? So often in uh, young individuals going under, sorry, under resistance exercise, it's often to improve uh, health benefits or improve sport performance or if you're good enough, you might want to fine tune that for optimal elite performance. Um, but it's easy to overlook the kind of essential locomotory, locomotory functions that we use muscle for every day and many uh, underlying metabolic functions that are important. And this really becomes more obvious once we get to around 50 years of age in that we start to lose um, muscle mass at around 1-2% to per year and often we see greater decreases in strength and uh, muscle mass. Also get decreases in metabolic function and overall quality of life. So this in turn re results in increased care costs, especially in older, frail individuals. So we know that one of the most effective strategies to attenuate the loss of muscle mass and strength with age is to do resistance exercise. And it's been demonstrated quite nicely over this week that uh, essentially muscle hypertrophy occurs where muscle protein synthesis exceeds muscle protein breakdown. Um, after resistance exercise, we get various increases in muscle protein synthesis. Um, it's also been shown that acute muscle protein synthetic responses and hypertrophy are blunted with age. And also quite recently that these acute muscle protein synthetic responses uh, are not always predictive of muscle hypertrophy. So there's diff other things we can learn here about muscle protein synthesis. So just to quickly go over some trace techniques and bring in the idea of using heavy water to look at longer term measures of muscle protein synthesis. So essentially uh, a tracer is by, fo by following the incorporation of a functionally identical but detectable compound we can derive a rate of metabolism. Um, so depending on what trace you use depends on what me metabolic process you're looking at. So with amino acids if you get incorporation into muscle proteins you can look at the rate of incorporation. So what we usually describe as a tradi traditional tracer experiment um, a few limitations to these is that they're a controlled environment, uh, you require numerous infusions and they're often not a time constraint so you might have your participant in a bed and then you <coughs> apply a, a stimulus of exercise or training and look at the different rates of incorporation over this time. In comparison when you're using heavy water it's admin is administered via oral consumption so it can be less invasive and it has a long half-life within the body water so your deuterium gets incorporated into alanine quite rapidly and this enriches your precursor pool over long periods of time if you keep the body water enrichment uh, at a constant level. So you can, get, you can get free living measures of muscle protein synthesis in that over your uh, training period you can repeatedly, repeatedly perform your intervention and this gets a, an accumulation of uh, your participants' regular activity. So you're going to get long-term measurements as well. So the overall aim of the study was to look at uh, longer-term muscle protein synthesis responses to exercise in young and old individuals. So we had 10 younger individuals and 10 older individuals. Uh, average age was 23 and 69 years old. And uh, we kept them maintained uh, body water enrichment over the six weeks with 150 mil bolus and 50 mil top-ups. And we used a unilateral resistance exercise training regime, so train one leg three times a week for uh, <coughs> six weeks, six times eight repetitions at 75% 1RM. So then we've got a comparison between rested muscle protein synthesis and uh, trained. Uh, we monitored diet diaries and activities, uh, one week activity monitor over the six weeks training. Um, collected regular saliva to measure, measure, body, measure body water enrichment. We took biopsies from both the trained and untrained legs at zero, three and six weeks and the biopsies were timed acutely after exercise so we can look at various signaling responses. Uh, and we also did the same with blood samples and then we took ultrasound measures, zero, three and six weeks 
to look at muscle architecture changes and DEXA to look at muscle mass changes over the six weeks. So starting off looking at um, strength and mass adaptations, so looking at the percent change in 1RM, so this is the amount they could lift throughout the study. Um, both groups generally increase the dynamic load they could lift over the uh, training period. Uh, a slight benefit in the young as they were increased slightly quicker and at some stages were greater than the um, old. And then looking at the maximal voluntary contraction in train legs over the six weeks, uh, only young increased the uh, maximal voluntary contraction. So it suggests that some of the training benefits, some of the strength training benefits in the 1RM are not quite transferred into the maximal static contraction. Looking at measures of measures of mass, uh, mass, only young increased thigh fat free mass over the six weeks, as well as having greater thigh fat free mass at both the start and the end. And additionally, only young increased uh, muscle thickness, and this peaked early on into the resistance exercise training regime, uh, plateau in thereafter. So moving on from this, we wanted to look at many of the mechanisms that are involved in, diff in muscle hypertrophy. Um, and we looked at some of these aspects. So uh, during muscle growth, it's been shown that ribosomal biogenesis is an important factor. Uh, and MIC and the transcription in initiation factor 1A are important um, promoters of ribosomal DNA transcription. Um, Anabolic signaling, ag anabolic signaling, the well-known mTOR pathway, activating P70 to increase muscle protein synthesis and translation initiation and elongation. We also looked at anabol anabolic horm hormones, um, IGF-1 testosterone, that are important drivers in uh, muscle hypertrophy. So looking at long-term measures of muscle protein synthesis, over the first three weeks, there was no difference in resting muscle protein synthesis between groups and only the young group increased trained muscle protein synthesis over the first three weeks. And then looking over the second half of the study, so three to six weeks, um, again, no difference in resting muscle protein synthesis. Um, in the young individuals, the heightened muscle protein synthesis response was now reduced, so it was no greater than rested, and there was still no significant increase in old. So this matches our early increase in muscle architecture as well of hypertrophy occurring, occurring early into the exercise regime. If we look at the absolute synthetic rate, so the muscle protein synthesis rate, not to six weeks, and the mass change, so the actual mass that's in the, the actual grams of protein synthesized per day, that only increased in young over the six week training period. So looking at various um, anabolic signaling pathways, uh, or mechano signaling, uh, P7E was increased only in young and this was only after the first exercise bout. Uh, so this was 60 to 90 minutes after the exercise at both basal three weeks and six weeks. And then it was reduced thereafter. Uh, so initial increases in ERK signaling that was blunted and old after the first exercise bout um, with no difference in 4 bp one <coughs> So looking at the RNA content, which is a good marker of um, amount of ribosomes you have, so the capacity for uh, muscle protein synthesis. We saw early increases in the RNA to DNA ratio, and that was only in young, and the RNA to protein ratio. So these are indices of kind of RNA content. And some of the mechanisms that drive the amount of your ribosomal biogenesis. So early increases in MIC protein level and the mRNA in uh, MIC, and also early increases in the um, TIF1 uh, total content after the first exercise bout. Looking at anabolic ho hormone levels, so um, with resistance exercise, muscle recruitment stimulates the release of hormones. Um, we looked at myostatin. There was no difference between young or old, either before or after exercise. Um, IGF-1, young had greater levels of IGF-1 uh, with no effect of acute resistance exercise. Uh, and testosterone levels, young had greater levels of testosterone and only the young increased the amount of testosterone acutely after his exercise bout. So to try and sum this all together um, with the idea that anabolic blunting is multifactorial and is not likely just to be solely one aspect of muscle growth. We see um, unfavorable anabolic environments, so both 
chronically low anabolic ho hormones and um, n uh, lack of a, an acute increase, um, a decrease in the translational capacity, uh, decreased translational efficiency by P70, and over the long-term training period, this was resulted in reduced muscle protein synthesis and reduced muscle protein hypertrophy. So I'd just like to say thank you to all those involved and uh, funding bodies as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>